morning, everyone. It's, it's lovely to be in West Roxbury this morning with you all. I'm so impressed to see so many people turning up this morning. Is it louder? I don't know if they can hear you. I don't think the mics work. Hello, is it your mic? Maybe the others are louder. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. That's better. Good. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz Braden, Councillor Liz Braden, Chair of the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Com Communities. Still can't hear me? I'm sorry, use your outdoor voice. Yeah. Use my use outdoor your voice. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Liz Braden, Chair of the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Communities. This is Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. We are here today for a public hearing on docket number 0246, order for a hearing to assess the need for a senior centre in the neighbourhood of West Roxbury. Referred to the committee on January 25th, 2023. This docket was sponsored by Councillors Kendra Lara, Councillor Michael Flaherty and Rusty Louisienne. This hearing is being recorded. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.swfc at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all councillors. If you wish to provide public testimony and have not signed up to do so, please sign up uh, sign in at the table, there's a table um, on the way in if you want to make public testimony. This morning, and also th for those folks who want to come up, uh, when you make public testimony, you come up to the lectern here at the front, but if you need to sit down while you make your comments, we'll facilitate that. This morning I'm joined by my council colleagues and representatives from the city, administration, ethos and senior volunteers and other elected officials. This morning we have uh, Councillors uh, Lara, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Louis Jean, they're the co-sponsors, Councillor Murphy, City Councillor at Large, Representative Rob Consalvo, Representative Co uh, Coppinger, who's also going to um, share some remarks from Senator Rush. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, we will have two panels this morning, um, a panel from the administration, Jose Masso, Chief uh, of Human Services, uh, Commissioner Emily Shea from Age Strong, and Commissioner Marta Rivera from BCYF. And then non-city organizations, Val Freyas of CEO of Athos, uh, Ray Santos, uh, Chief Development and Public Relations Officer for Ethos, Jan Hamilton, Senior Volunteer, and Kathy Conway, Senior Volunteer. So, uh, with no further ado, I'll just ask our uh, lead sponsors for some opening remarks. Councillor Lara, would you like to make some opening remarks? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Beautiful. Thank you everyone for being here this morning and to all my colleagues for coming here to have this important conversation. Um, for all of you that it's your first time here, welcome to West Roxbury. Um, senior centers have become one of the most widely used services um, for America's older adults and we've really seen incredible success with senior programming here in West Roxbury. So we know that that reality rings true here. Um, in West Roxbury, we have a population of over 9,000 senior citizens. It's the second largest number of any Boston neighborhood. This is 27% of the neighborhood here, and that is the highest concentration of seniors in any neighborhood in the city of Boston. Now, I'm not going to sit here and read off a bunch of statistics to you all or really make comment about the benefits that come with senior centers because we all know what those are, and that's why we're here today. What I will say is that all of you have dedicated your life to your families, to your neighborhoods, and to your work. And you deserve, and all seniors across the city deserve, a right to age with dignity and in your community. And I think that we can facilitate that um, by building a standalone senior center in West Roxbury. I hope that this conversation today moves us one step closer to getting to that goal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lara. Councillor Flaherty. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for your participation, for coming out this morning, and uh, very, very, very brief because we want to hear uh, from all of you. As referenced, there are 9,000 seniors here in West Roxbury. That's a significant uh, number of folks, and West Roxbury seniors uh, deserve their own uh, standalone, dedicated space for programming. Look, here, look forward to hearing from all of you uh, and get your ideas as to how we can continue to work together to make that a reality for folks out here in West Roxbury. And it's a pleasure to serve as your at-large counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councillor Julia Mejia. Um, Councillor Louis Jean. Um. Thank you, Chair Braden. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, West Roxbury. Um, very happy to be here this morning to have this conversation with you about the leadership that you all have already shown around organizing to get the senior center. We think about all of that, all that you have given to the city of Boston. It's time for us to give back to you and make sure that you have a place where you can gather and be in community and in fellowship with each other. So I'm uh, happy to be here as a, one of your at-large city councilors, really care about all of our residents. During the opera process, I fought for money and more resources alongside our incredible um, age strong commissioner, Commissioner Shea, who I saw, I think she may be on the panel, but um, to make sure that we're, we're uh, allocating resources for social programming for our, for our uh, elderly residents to make sure that after the pandemic and while we were going through the pandemic, that people who were experiencing loneliness and isolation, that we were creating opportunities for folks to gather and to go on um, activities and, uh, and, and trips together. So I hope that we can do more of that and I'm excited for the potential of programming that will come from a West Roxbury Senior Center. So very happy to be here in this discussion with you and looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Good morning, West Roxbury. How are you all today? It's, it's great to see you all. So um, as you probably know, I'm Erin Murphy. I'm an, one of your at-large city councillors. And do just want to start by saying I was very fortunate growing up that I had my grandparents growing up when we lived close by. My grandmother, um, Gingy, lived till she was 103, and my other grandparents lived into their 90s. So I also, as a young mom, my, my own children had several great grandparents. So we definitely grew up in a family where um, we didn't just value the seniors, but understood how important you are to your family, but also to your community. My grandmother was at the Murphy School Community Center Senior Center when it first opened. I always do like to remind you that was named after my grandfather, Richard J. Murphy. But during the day, they had a small room on the second floor of the Murphy School, and they would have lunch, and then sometimes they would let them go swimming in the pool with the special needs students, and it was wonderful to see. And then the Murphy School became a K-8, to and that space was taken for them from a science lab. And just earlier this week, I was at the Mildred Ave meeting because they're working to dedicate a space. They do have a space on the second floor of that community center that they're going to dedicate to seniors. But I have seen too often that we give seniors a small space, they have to share it with another you know, center or community center, and then oftentimes, unfortunately, they're the first to go or their programming doesn't stay. So I know that we have the dedication of Chief Masso and Ethos is here also, but Ellen, um, Emily from Age Strong. So just think this conversation is important, but when I, I knew this would be a packed room, but when I saw they were bringing in chairs and it's standing room only, you know this in West Roxbury, but continue to advocate, but know that you have our back on the council because I do believe that you deserve a standalone senior center. There's one in Brighton, there's one in Charlestown, and they get to have lots of great programming because they know nobody has to outschedule them or they have to be the first one to you know, get on the calendar. So thank you very much. And I I do have a um, prior engagement, so if you see me sneak out, it's because I'm going to a school in Chinatown to celebrate a lion dance. So I'm sorry if I step out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mejia. Good morning, West Roxbury. How are you all doing? Love to see this energy and really want to thank Councillor Lada for her leadership in working alongside you all to organize because when we show up, right, and listen, you all show up and tell us what we need to do and our job is to deliver. So I just want to say thank you to Councillor Lada for bringing us together and, and her co-sponsor, Councillor Flaherty, to, in recognizing the importance of this moment right now. 
You know, I always talk about the fact that my mom right now is 73 years old and too poor to retire. She lives next door to me, so I'm very fortunate that I get to support my mom. However, that is not the case for so many of our elders who are at home alone and need a space where they can convene with their peers and live um, and create environments where you all can have a little bit of joy. You've worked too hard in this city to not have a space that you can call your own here in West Roxbury. So I just want you to know as one of your four at-large city councilors that not only am I here to listen and learn, but to utilize my award-winning personality to fight on your behalf. Because you know I'm known like the little chihuahua on the city council. So when I care deeply about something, I go hard for it and trust that you have a partner in me in this discussion. Thank you. Our colleague, uh, Councillor Co um, Coletta from uh, District 1, uh, sent her apologies this morning. Dear Councillor Liz Braden and Council colleagues, I regret to inform you that I will be absent from today's committee hearing on docket 0246, order for a hearing to assess the need for a senior centre in the neighbourhood of West Roxbury on February 2nd, 2023, due to a previous commitment. Kindly, uh, kindly read this letter into the record. I am supportive of more spaces for our seniors across the city of Boston and support the West Roxbury community in having its own centre. I was so pleased to attend the opening of the East Boston Senior Centre last year where a portion of funding came through airport impact mitigation. I encourage the Age Strong Commission and the Public Facilities Department to solicit similar partnerships to make this a reality for the West Roxbury community. Sincerely, Gabriella Coletta. So with no further ado, I would like to invite our first panel, uh, the administration panel. Um, uh, Chief of Human Resources, Jose Masso. I'm, I'm assuming we have a, is that the correct order? Yeah. Yep. Um, Commissioner Emily Shea and Marta Rivera. Um, Mr. Masso, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, Chief. Chair Braden, uh, just for the record that um, Commissioner Rivera is not in attendance today and she won't be joining us today. Uh, however, good morning, uh, Chair Braden, Council Lara, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jen, Council Mejia, and Council Murphy. Council Lara, I want to thank you for your leadership and for giving us the opportunity to be together this morning. For the record, my name is Jose Masso and I am the Chief of Human Services for the City of Boston. I'm joined today by my colleague, Commissioner Emily Shea of the Age Strong Commission. And as folks in this room have kindly uh, titled her, one of the best commissioners in, in this, uh, the country. So, uh, yeah. In my role, I oversee the Age Strong Commission, an agency that both funds and provides direct services for older adults, including the operation of two senior centers. And I also oversee the Boston Centers for Youth and Families, which operates 36 community centers, including two dedicated senior centers. I am very excited to be here today and to be able to see many of our older adult residents in attendance. It's wonderful to see familiar faces and to have this time to hear more about our residents' vision for how we can be a, better, a city that better meets the needs of our older adult residents. As Commissioner Shea will share in a moment, we know how important programming is for our older adult residents. It offers a vital opportunity to connect with others and a chance to be physically active, to learn new skills, and to build community. And the need is something that spans neighborhoods. Many are calling for us to redouble our efforts, especially as the pandemic eases, to reach out to older adults. For this reason, we are looking to take a holistic approach to programming for older adults, to step back and see where programming is available and where it isn't, and adjust our funding to address those gaps. Hearings like the one today provide valuable insight into helping us do that type of needs assessment. I will hand it off to Commissioner Shea to share more detail, but first, I want, to thank, I want to close by thanking the residents who are here today. I remember clearly that one of the first coffee hours I attended when I first came on board at the city last spring was the West Roxbury Coffee Hour at Billings Field. It was a beautiful morning filled with sunshine. In fact, it was my birthday, so I remember it fondly. And the largest contingent at the coffee hour was this group of older women who had signs. <laughs> Commissioner Shea kindly introduced us and I was able to get my first insights into the issues that were discussed that day. Thanks especially to Val Davis, who was leading the charge for a time, and to Jan Hamilton, who has taken up the mantle now. We are grateful for your partnership, for your leadership, and for your advocacy. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Shea. Thank you all. Commissioner Shea, thank you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Braden, counselors, um, and Councilor Lara, thanks for convening us today on this important issue. Um, and hello, everybody. So glad you're here today. Um, my name is Emily Shea, and I'm the Age Strong Commissioner for the City of Boston. Our mission is to enhance the lives of people 55 and over with meaningful programs, resources, and connections so that together we can all live and age strong in Boston. And I say that because it's important that we recognize we're all aging, right, and that we are prepare, pre all preparing for that and making sure that our communities are prepared for that. Um, we're Boston's Council on Aging and Area Agency on Aging, which means that not only do we provide a lot of direct services for older adults across the city, some of you may have ridden on the Age Strong Shuttle or met one of our advocates in the neighborhoods, um, but it also, we're also, um, and as an area agency on aging, we also fund a network of partner organizations across Boston who provide services to our older residents. And I know you're gonna hear from one of our fabulous partner uh, organizations, Ethos, here today. Um, older adults are one of Boston's fastest growing populations. We had 88,000 people over 60 in 2010, 118,000 people over 60 in 2020, and in the latest UMass Donahue Institute projections that I've seen, which are from 2018, that number is projected to grow to 135,000 by 2025, 146,000 by 2030, and 161,000 by 2040, which would be an 82% increase in people over 60 in only 30 years. It's also a very diverse group. In 2018, close to 38% of older adults in the city were foreign born with about one third of those speaking a language other than English at home. So we need to be focused on and planning for the growth in this population and for the growth in diversity. We're focused on supporting people to live well and age well in Boston. There's a number of important factors in that. Having enough money to be able to live and age with dignity and meet your basic needs, accessible communities, access to programs and services, and ways to connect and engage. And we're here today to talk, of, talk about one of my favorite topics, which is senior programming. So connection and engagement are essential for aging well. At the Age Strong Commission, we support programming in a number of different ways. We have two senior centers, one in East Boston and one in Brighton. We also have a team of four people, our outreach and engagement team, who coordinate both in-person and virtual events and programming across the city. With our Older Americans Act money, we fund 11 partner organizations to provide programming across Boston, and we convene and support Boston's Senior Programming Network, which brings folks together who are running senior programming in a learning and sharing community, providing them with training and small funding opportunities to enhance their programs. In the past two years, we've also been able to use some extra funds that were unspent in our budget uh, to give community grants. So in FY22, we funded 17 community-based organizations to support older adults with digital access programs. And right now, we have 16 community organizations operating programs we funded focused on creating social connections and reducing isolation. Um, I also want to speak to our city partners, Boston Centers for Youth and Families, has two senior centers in Boston, in Charlestown and in Grove Hall, and they have senior programs running in many of their spaces, including here in West Roxbury. And I know some of you have been able to participate in yoga and bridge and all the other things that, that are happening in those spaces. Um, and, Bo and Boston Public Libraries also has a number of programs that older adults engage in across the city. So it's a lot, but we know that it does not fully meet the need. And our hope for the future is to have ongoing programming across the city for older adults. We think it will be important to create an equitable plan that drives the growth in this programming, taking into account programs that currently exist, who does not have access, and how we can leverage consistent spaces where programming can happen, and how we can make sure that people get to that programming 
Um, so there's a lot of things that we need to figure out, including you know, spaces, uh, uh, transportation, and also uh, funding. The, uh, I wanted to speak just for a minute to the process for East Boston because I've fielded a lot of questions about that. That was a senior center that we just opened up um, in November. I'm trying to remember. The, the months are foggy, but um, it was November that we, that we opened that up and we actually started programming there uh, on the first day of December, December 1st. Um, that senior center, it took about 15 years to get off the ground. <laughs> I know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but I just I, I just want to I want to make sure people people understand. Um, so it, it was a lot of community advocacy, and there were some uh, amazing uh, older adults, um, just like in this neighborhood, who really advocated for that. Um, the funding for the operations of this that center came from a community mitigation from Massport. Um, so Massport is funding uh, 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 a good amount of the, the ongoing operating costs of that center. Um, they're paying for the, the staff to, uh, to do the coordination and programming. Um, and the city was able to, uh, to uh, donate a, a library, give a library, uh, when a new library was built in East Boston, um, we were trying to figure out what were the uses for the other two library spaces, and so one of them um, the city gave for uh, this partnership with Massport for the community for the the senior center. Um, so I just wanted to explain that. Um, and so I know I've I've talked a lot, and I know counselors, you have uh, you have questions. So I'm going to stop there, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, we'll proceed to the um, holder questions and, and proceed to the next panel, the non-city organizations. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, yes, who has who who's got a question? Oh, Councillor Lara, sorry, beg your pardon. I didn't see you. I, I keep, in the city hall, we have a little red light that flashes when you want to speak, so <laughs> you're gonna have to put your hands up. <laughs> thank you. We're doing our best here. Thank you all so much, and um, thank you to Commissioner Shea and Chief Muscle for being here today and sharing a little bit about the work that you do. I do have a few questions. Uh, my first question is the, and, and this I'm gonna share a little bit of context. The World Health Organization uses a framework for their age-friendly cities network. And this is just for folks that are not familiar with it. They use eight areas um, to identify and address barriers to well-being and participation for seniors in cities. And during the Walsh administration, Boston began a process of becoming one of those age-friendly cities. Uh, is that still something that's a priority for Age Strong? Where are we in that process? And do you think that in addition of another senior center could help us get closer to that goal? Sure, um, so yes, we are definitely uh, an, uh, an age and dementia friendly city. We work on that every day. We have a team of uh, three folks in my office that uh, work on a lot of different issues associated with that. Um, uh, certainly enhanced programming um, and engagement for people across the city is part of being an age and dementia friendly city. I, I don't know, Counselor, how much you've had a chance to look at it, but social participation is yes, one of those one eight, eight. Um, those eight items as well as uh, respect and, and, um, in, and social inclusion. And so I think both of those certainly speak to uh, what happens in, a, in um, senior programming. Um, we're, we do a lot of other things um, with that. We've actually worked with a lot of the businesses here in West Roxbury um, who've been trained as age and dementia friendly businesses. Um, we are working on a, uh, a plan around economic security that we'll be rolling out um, for older adults in the city. Uh, we're working with the Boston Public Health Commission to see how we can do more around dementia um, and uh, uh, a lot of different things. So yes, that is still uh, one of our priority items. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. And you've both mentioned the standalone senior centers that we have in the city of Boston and that we've recently opened one in East Boston. Can you tell us a little bit how you prioritize locations for senior centers? 
Um, sure. So, so I, 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 you know, I think when when I was speaking, I, I spoke to kind of having uh, really needing to do a citywide plan mm -hmm. um, around where programming happens. Um, I can say that the senior center in East Boston was really community driven. Um, and and happened um, through the community advocacy, um, both with Massport and um, and with with the city. Um, the senior center in Brighton um, has been a senior center for a long time, and um, I actually don't know how it ended up being a senior center uh, for quite a long time it was a nonprofit operating a senior center within a city building mm -hmm. at some point in time way before my tenure and I've been here 12 years um, the staff of the nonprofit um, uh, 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 ended up coming on and being staff at the city um, and now we operate that center so um, that is uh, so that's I think a, a long-standing thing um, in uh, and then, um, I'm not sure that I can speak to the to the BCYF sites, um, but I I know that there's there certainly was a need, and I think that the Grove Hall site um, uh, there was um, there was a need there for senior programming. Mm -hmm. I know they're actually looking; they're going to be building a new Grove Hall Community Center because there's, there's a need for more space for everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. Um, so it seems, like, it seems like the prioritization is both based on the need and the request of the people in the neighborhood, um, as well as availability of funds and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, I will say we have not had a lot of standalone senior centers open. Yep. Um, and so, um, so, you know, I think we've had one recent experience, but um, but there's not a, there's not a ton of history to base it on. Thank you. That's incredibly helpful. Um, so you shared a little bit to <laughs> a lot of uh, fanfare about how the East Boston Senior Center took about 15 years to get up. <laughs> and one of the conversations that we have been having in our meetings here in West Roxbury is about wanting to get a senior center while all of our beautiful seniors are still here <laughs> to enjoy it. <laughs> Um, so can you share a little bit more about the process and timeline? I know that it took that long, but if you can share more details about how we got from point A to point B. Um, so I can, so I can't, uh, so I think that, it, it, you mean chair in East Boston, what happened? Yeah, I think just okay. generally, if, I know that sure. you have a timeline, which so sure. I, I guess what would be the process if the I, city were to say, yes, we're going to open a senior center in West Roxbury, what does that look like? So I'm not sure I can speak to the city process for opening new spaces. I can, I can tell people what happened mm -hmm. as, as far as I know it, what, what happened in East Boston. I was not involved in the whole process. Um, but I think that uh, community conversations started around it when people started um, thinking about having a casino in East Boston and what were going to be community priorities around that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the conversation continued after the casino didn't off open there and, and uh, the older residents started advocating both with the city and with Massport. Um, and then when Massport was doing the community mitigation, they raised their voices again and, and um, and I think that was probably, my guess is that was like 2015 or so, 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, once, uh, once Massport dedicated the funds, the city then dedicated the building. I actually wasn't involved in that, in that process. Um, and uh, but was very excited to work with uh, the architects to make sure that you know it, it's uh, the best um, uh, building that it can be for for our older residents there. Thank you, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. I have two more questions, if that's okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, um, my second to last question is that last year Mayor Wu did an audit of city-owned land, and I am curious if you think that there's any site in the neighborhood that could meet our needs for a senior center, 
And if not, are you willing to include the $100,000 in the capital budget that will help us get a siting study for the center? I, so, so I don't actually have control over the capital budget. Um, and uh, we don't have any, uh, the Age Strong Commission doesn't have, even our, even the two senior centers that we operate, they're not our spaces, so that we don't, we don't have any facilities at the Age Strong Commission. Um, so we don't have, we don't play a role in the capital budget um, process. Um, I, I would, I, you know, I think it, the, it's exciting um, that there was an audit done on city-owned land, and I'd be happy to, to take a look at it. And um, I think identifying both spaces for uh, senior programs and also spaces for senior housing, mm -hmm. um, especially given, given our um, uh, population projections would be, would be an important thing. Yeah, absolutely. And so this might be a question for Chief Maso to uh, maybe weigh in on. Sure. So. Um in terms of, uh, I mean, to Commissioner Shea's point, I don't have the exact details in terms of what is available, uh, so I can't speak to that directly. Uh, however, I know for our cabinet, for Human Services Cabinet, we are prioritizing the programming for older adult residents. Um, so that's something that we're looking at. I believe the process, the full process, requires additional input from departments that are now represented here today. Um, and Commissioner Shea alluded to some of them, PFD, et cetera, that have the, the knowledge and experience of what the exact process will be, identifying any other potential locations. Thank you so much, Chief. And my final question, uh, Rep Coppinger, who I'm not sure, I think yeah, he's, he's here, here with us. Beautiful, thank you. Secure $250,000 for senior programming in West Roxbury through the state. And <laughs> thank you, Rep Coppinger. And we've been working collaboratively to really offer a draft of a plan for what to do with those resources and possibly find a location a few times a week where ultimately we can have programming centralized temporarily while we kind of go through a longer process. Um, Commissioner Shea, is there any update on where we are with using those resources? And I know that Rep Coppinger will be giving public testimony, so maybe he can share some as well, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, uh to steal the representative's thunder, <laughs> but All right. we'll wait. We'll wait, we'll wait for Rob Coppinger okay. to give us an update. Thank you so um, much. But I, I will. I would just say, you know, we're we're um, very appreciative of the representative and and happy to be a part of that. Thank you so much, Commissioner. No further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. And obviously, as we we all know, that West Roxbury has the highest percentage of seniors uh, in the city. And uh, 15 years is too long. God, I, I'll probably be dead by then. Yeah. Um, I hope not. So, yeah, if not, I'll still be on the council as your at-large council. Right? Well, hope not either. So, um, so to the chief and to the commission, any thoughts to a, a temporary site? Any thoughts to sort of a creative partnership, uh, a sale lease back, uh, working with some existing facilities? For example, here at the Elks, I see uh, Lord Mayor Richie Gormley here at the Irish Social Club. Um, any any opportunity there where we can be a little creative, identify a location and a site temporarily while we work out, um, I guess, the particulars working with our partners, uh, State Representative Coppinger and Senator Rush and uh, uh, State Representative Rob Consalvo and the members of the council. So I'm all for expediting a process here and, um, and if we have to do something in the short term or something temporary, uh, we should be having those conversations and then sort of the bigger uh, longer term plan, but uh, un, uh, unacceptable uh, folks in this community, some of our highest tax um, base here, um, having to wait that long for for a, a community, a senior center, it's, uh, it's, that's, that's excessive. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Councillor, I don't want you to think that, um, you know, with the 15 years, I was just saying what the process was in East Boston um, and how long that took, so certainly not recommending that. Um, but I'd, I think that um, there have been some discussions uh, with Rep Coppinger and about um, uh, the funding that he secured um, as an earmark in the state budget and where programming can exist. But given that the representative is going to speak to that, um, I, I don't want to speak to that at this point because um, it would just be duplicative and I, I want the representative to be able to, to talk about it. 
Very good. And then just lastly, I just want to give a shout out to our Boston police officers, our community service officers. They do great work on behalf of our seniors and our youth. And so thank you for being here and for your continued advocacy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, next up, uh, Councillor Louis Jean. Thank you, Chair Braden. And as I heard someone say, I didn't say my name, uh, Councillor Ruti Louis-Jean at large. Um, I want to thank Commissioner uh, Shea and Chief Masso for being here and for offering um, the testimony. I think um, there's a lot of energy obviously here and around the city to make sure that we're providing uh, adequate programming for our seniors in West Roxbury um, and around the city. I know this is a live conversation that's happening in Mattapan. All of our seniors really deserve to uh, have programming and age and digni uh, with dignity um, uh, in community. And if we wait 15 years, I will soon be asking for my own senior center. So we do need to get this done uh, before uh, 15 years. And you know, government can be slow and can be very bureaucratic and can take very long to get things done. But when there's this much energy and when there's this much support at uh, the state and municipal level, we should be able to work together to get it done sooner. Um, my question first is for Chief Masso with respect to the um, senior centers that we are currently op uh, operating, is it happening in a, in a centralized manner in at BCYF, or is each standalone senior center um, involved in d determining what their own programming looks like? So each. Uh, and sorry, I can't see you. It's no, like an, no worries no. at all. Thank you so much, Councillor. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. So each each one does operate based on the needs of the community. Um, and the constituents which they serve. And so uh, Charlestown, for example, may have different programming uh, offered there than in comparison to the one at Grove Hall. Um, I have been able to participate in the programming that took place at Grove Hall, in which they had like a game day. Um, I lost, uh, to be honest, uh, in dominoes, and they were not easy on me at all. However, uh, it was just, uh, in speaking with the residents there, uh, they did address, you know, what is that they're interested in as well. They had um, some feedback in regards to uh, potential programming for the new community center that's going to be built in Grove Hall as well. Uh, so we are, um, we recognize that there may be a uniformed approach in terms of uh, blanket offerings. However, we want to make sure that in each community we meet the specific needs of that community um, and don't say that we're not going to take a band-aid approach and say, hey, this is one size fits all. We want to make sure that as we show up in each community in each neighborhood uh, that we are representing and supporting uh, the needs of our older adult residents there. Great, and, and maybe this follow-up question is for, for both the chief and the commissioner. Um, is there a, a structure that allows for that sort of direct engagement and um, input from uh, our elder residents? Um, is there like a senior action committee that, over, that gives input? Like what does that structure look like for us to make sure that when, we, when these are built that they continue to operate based on what uh, our elder, elderly residents want and need? Sure, um, that's a really good question, um, Councillor, because I think unless we're uh, listening to the community, um, we can't meet the community's needs. Um, I'll give an example, I, you know, uh, it's, as I said, it's so great to see everybody out here today. Um, we also have had a lot of interest in senior programming in other neighborhoods. Um, we were in Hyde Park um, a couple of weeks ago um, and what we did uh, that day in Hyde Park is we brought in all different types of programs that um, uh, to give people a taste of what programming was like. We also had a survey there um, so that people could fill out surveys um, to let us know what types of things they wanted to see. We did something similar in Mattapan and we're doing mm -hmm. something similar in the North End. Um, but I think that on kind of ongoing input is, um, is extremely important. Um, both before you get a program started and then as you continue uh, doing programming after that. Great, thank you. And then just two short questions, hopefully. Mind, the way that I've interpreted this need um, is that it has become more acute and more relevant um, after the pandemic, where the pandemic really isolated people in their homes and really led to a lot of um, 
both in our young res old residents, older residents, and in our young residents, a lot of acute mental health issues. Uh, have you been seeing that as well? And what is the programming uh, that has been coming out of Age Strong as a direct response to this need for us to really have community and be together? Um, and, you know, obviously, as I said, this was something that mattered a lot to to me during w allocating uh, federal resources during ARPA. But curious if, if you've seen that need for community and gathering for our senior residents become more acute post pandemic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's I think there's always been a need, but you're right. The um, the time that we all spent isolated during the pandemic was challenging for sure. Um, and we know that building social connections can boost your lifespan by 50%. It's actually, the research is pretty incredible. Um, that is why we dedicated um, uh, $370,000 to these Creating Connections grants that I mentioned mm -hmm. um, across the city and why we were um, so grateful for the, um, for the uh, dedicated ARPA dollars um, to try to get more programming up and running across the city. We certainly are hearing from all neighborhoods um, that, um, that older adults need more, connect, more opportunities for connection. Um, and uh, we are um, uh, hopeful that we can continue to work to bring them what they, what they need and what they want. Great, thank you, Commissioner. And given that, given that recognition of the of the more acuteness of the need, what then? If, if there is one biggest barrier to this being a 15-year process, what is that? And what can we do to really chip away at that? Hmm. <laughs> I I mean, I I guess for a space to happen, for 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 programming to happen anywhere, right? You need a space. You need uh, the the funds. And by funds, it's the funds really go towards um, coordination, uh, potentially bringing in instructors, usually some food, and potentially transportation. So those are those are kind of the the um, pieces to the puzzle. Great. And then so this is my last question for real. Is there a dollar amount for how much it would take to get this built? And for what the annual operating cost would be, either based on projections on what um, so, I don't have a I don't have a dollar amount to to get it built. I, I think if for any building, right? You need to figure out like what this. I, and I am not by any means. I um, I've only owned a condo for two years, so <laughs> <laughs> I I had something break the other day, and I actually thought about moving. So I'm not <laughs> I'm not the person to speak to facilities. Um, but I think that for anything, obviously, there's a, a budget for getting something up and running. I can tell you that the, that the East Boston Center, um, uh, uh, the city investment was a little over $5 million. That was an already existing building that needed some renovation. Um, and then in terms of uh, kind of dollar amount for uh, operating budget, um, I, I can certainly get those details to you of our kind of current spaces and what those those operating budgets look like. Um, but the way our two programs run right now, we have um, they have a staff of two, so a, a director and an assistant director, and then um, some money for um, programs to bring in instructors or buy craft supplies or whatever is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. I appreciate uh, all of your work. I think those numbers would really help ground us in this conversation. So look look forward to that. And as a recent homeowner myself, I am with you. I want to call the landlord whenever there's a problem. And the landlord is me. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Louisian. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for your testimony. Um, that information is helpful. I do just want to reiterate that if we as a city truly value our seniors, our capital budget and our spending is going to reflect that. So we do need to remember that we are a rich city and this room is full of people today, but we really need to continue to make sure that us on the council when it's budget season or every department knows that yes, 
Emily Shea, like you don't have a final say, but your voice does matter, and I know you know that. So, so continuing to make sure that you're reaching out not to your elect, just to your elected officials, but also to anyone who works in City Hall in any department that you can say, hey, can you advocate for this? Because the more voices always make a difference. Also, um, I know it is true, and you um, mentioned this, Emily, but you know the community has to drive the needs and you know the wants of the programming. So that's definitely a conversation, um, not if, but when this senior standalone center is built, that it will be the community that drives what, what's there. Because every neighborhood, as an at-large city councilor, I know firsthand that every neighborhood is different. There's lots of things that we have in common, but there's also different needs depending on where you live. And one thing through the pandemic, which was wonderful that Age Strong did step up and seniors, um, there's, there was a learning curve, not just for seniors, but for many to get connected to iPads or computers and understand Zoom. But a lot of programming, and you should check the Age Strong website if you don't already know, but every day there's different like salsa and different programming that anyone across the city can access. And I know many of our community centers now and senior centers do have that on their schedule. So you can be at home or you can show up at a center that's already there. Um, just one other thing, um, you were mentioning the East Boston and community benefits when big developments happen is a big thing for neighborhoods. I would have to you know, ask you, people who live here in West Roxbury, but I don't see that there's any big development coming that you'd be able to get a windfall like East Boston did a building, a building or something. So even though um, you're here today, I don't think, even though I know you get a room full of seniors, you can move mountains, you can make things happen, but I wouldn't want you to leave today thinking that the burden for this center is on just your shoulders. Make sure that you understand that seeing you here today and your voices matter, but you definitely need young kids. We should have school-aged children out here too advocating for a senior center. They have grandparents, their parents will be seniors soon. We need everyone in the community, not just the seniors advocating for this to make this happen. So no other questions, and I do look forward to the other panelists to hear. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, Councillor uh, Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to Commissioner Shea and Chief Maso. Um, I was startled with the 15-year timeline, too, because that's a long time to hurry up and wait um, for anything these days. And so I am encouraged, though, that we do have an administration that has really been thinking outside the box in terms of how do we remove those barriers um, to move things along because when it comes to government, it feels like drip, drip, drip molasses. Um, and uh, I think that there are ways for us to uh, do things a little bit different to, to meet the moment. And so I want to encourage us to really think outside the box as we continue to move this conversation uh, forward. Um, I guess I do have some questions. I always say that Boston is resource rich, but coordination poor. Um, and so we have this amazing opportunity uh, to work across different city departments. And I'm just curious if you, know, if you had to name a few departments that could help support this work outside of Age Strong, what would, what would those departments be? I, I think about workforce development, a lot of our age, a lot of our seniors, yes, you guys have retired, but I'm sure you have a lot of great ideas and innovative ways that you may want to develop a side business. And if there's a way for us to have a community center that creates an opportunity for you to do that, that could be some dollars that we can tap into through workforce development. So what I'm asking Emily to and um, Chief Maso to share with us is like, what are the other pots of dollars in departments that we can lean into in terms of programming for our seniors? Um, I'd, I'd <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the other pots of dollars are, per se. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm familiar with, um, with a lot of folks' budgets. Um, I, I will say that we do try to partner across departments, um, certainly 
uh, so because you're talking specifically programming, certainly uh, partnerships across departments are important for all of our age-friendly work, right? We work with very closely with transportation and public works on accessibility of sidewalks. We work very closely with economic development around small businesses and making those age-friendly. Um, we're working closely with the Boston Public Health Commission. We work closely um, around, I guess, around programs with, um, with other folks in our cabinet, so Boston uh, uh, Centers for Youth and Families, with the libraries, as I mentioned. Um, we also work closely with the Disabilities Commission, with Immigrant Advancement. Um, you know, potentially there's the opportunity to, to talk to the, uh, the Worker Empowerment Cabinet and see uh, kind of if there's an opportunity for workforce development funds um, and, and how that, figure out how that relates to programming. Um, there could be an opportunity, uh, we actually have a creative uh, aging program that we do in partnership with um, the Arts and Culture Cabinet and um, a, a community partner, Goddard House, that has been funding some of the, that work. They actually, uh, uh, we're gonna be expanding some of that work over the next year. So I, I think that um, you're right, Counselor, that um, everything we do, we should do in partnership, right? Older adults don't just touch, touch age strong. Uh, there are so many facets to living and growing older that touch all different departments. And I'll add to that, Council, as well. Um, so for our cabinet, uh, one of the goals that we actually uplifted is uh, increasing programming for older adults um, as a cabinet goal. You know, And so uh, we have the benefit of having many departments in our cabinet, including, of course, A. Strong, the libraries, uh, veteran services, BCYF. And so those touch points do happen. And so we want to make sure that the coordination happens first within our cabinet and then, of course, uh, to the external uh, city agencies as well. Um, additionally, I think the other departments, uh, we could look at operations, uh, would be a potential department uh, to definitely engage in these conversations. PFD, uh, Office of Neighborhood Services, Civic um, Engagement and Organizing as well. Uh, so those are the ones like, right off the top that I could definitely think of. Um, but we do have the extreme benefit of working closely with our internal departments to figure out like how does it, we're increasing programming at our library sites, at our BCYF sites, um, and as you speak about um, employment, uh, just to inf inform folks that we are going to be rolling out some part-time positions for lifeguards. So if anybody, just just put a call to action out there. We are we gotta work. Yes, we are in need of lifeguards. So I am more than happy to talk through that, in that process when it uh, becomes available. But I am very serious about that. For those swimmers in the room, yes. um, you'll see more information coming from us. Thank you. Yeah, no. And I, I hope y'all don't think I'm putting y'all to work. You, I'm, I, it's not even about the workforce development piece, but I really do want to uplift that there are a lot of seniors who have um, communicated to our office because I'm the chair of workforce development, that they are looking for opportunities um, beyond retirement to be able to um, continue to earn extra income and they're looking for creative ways to do that. So I, I wanna uplift that. This is just something that we've heard. But I'm glad that you have um, on the record had identified the fact, it seems like in terms of programming, we're good. Where it seems like the work that we need to focus on is identifying the location and the dollars to have a permanent space for all of these amazing ideas and programming to exist, right? It seems like the number one barrier um, to what we're here today is the location. And I guess um, through the chair, would love to see if there was an opportunity when we do a second um, hearing uh, to invite someone for, from faci um, facilities or those folks who uh, do the um, capital budget because those are the spaces and places where I think I'm um, having them on the record talking about what the possibility looks like might be helpful um, in terms of helping us level set because what I don't want us to do is to walk into this conversation with some false hope that we can make something happen when we don't have all of the information in terms of what it's going to take to make it happen. I'm still unclear in terms of what the dollar amount is. And I know, um, Commissioner, you were really clear that you don't know what it would cost. But I'm curious if there's anyone here, or um, Chief Maso, if you have an idea. And I know we were in Charlestown trying to get that pool um, open. And so there's a lot of, of different moving pieces in different departments that are not here to help us understand what's it going to take, right? Is it that fair to say? Yeah. It is fair to, to, to say in regards to that. So 
with that, I think that um, as we continue to move through the budget process, it's going to be really helpful if we have conversations with um, the the folks in the capital budget um, space, Councilor Lada. I think that you already, I'm sure, I want you all to know that Councilor Lada has already done a lot of this work um, and laying down the foundation and I um, just lining things up that there is a pathway towards victory. Um, and to Councilor Murphy's point, I'd love to see everyone participating in what advocacy looks like. It should not just be our elders here in this room. We should have businesses here um, advocating nonprofit organizations um, because at the end of the day, uh, it, it's going to take all of us to, to, to make it happen and wanted to just uplift that. Um, I'm here for, for that work. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Um, I'm Thank you. I'm very cognizant of the time, and I, I did omit to set a timer at the start of this, so I'm going to try. It's, uh, we're an hour in now. Um, just one quick question for the panel. Um, I, I think it relates to Councillor Mejia's uh, comment or Councillor Murphy's comment about coordination. Do, do we have a nod? Have we done an audit of programming across the city that's not just city programming, but other non-profit programming, and then also the coordination with, B, B, you know, between BCYF and, and Age Strong. Uh, one thing I know that many BCYF facilities are shared with, with schools and other programs, and very often I feel that the senior programming sometimes gets short shift, and um, I think it's really important um, as our population ages and, and our, to have our seniors have dedicated spaces that they uh, that we can have programming at times and uh, content that's appropriate for our seniors. So, and just in terms of have we done an audit of all the programs across the city, not just uh, provided by city service, uh, city programs, but other nonprofits? Do we have a um, do we have an idea of what the landscape looks like? Yeah, uh, Councillor, I would say that we have some idea of what the landscape looks like. We did a scan of programs that exist, um, probably about five or six years ago now, um, but so many of those programs are funded by little grants and it changes over time. Um, so I think we'll, we need to go back out and, and do it again. Yeah, I'd re we, I think that would be a really valuable exercise. You know, I know that uh, as the chair of this committee, we, 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 we accept grants regularly, um, you know, for Age Strong. And uh, just having a better sense of the landscape and knowing where the, where the de deficits are would be really helpful. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief Masso and, and Commissioner O'Shea. Um, I'm going to move along to the next panel. And you folks are welcome to stay. If we, you know, I'm sure we might have more questions for you. Uh, the next panelers are non-city non, uh, organizations. Val Frias from uh, the CEO of Ethos. Um, Ray Santos, Chief Development uh, and Public Relations Officer for Ethos. Jan Hamilton, Senior Volunteer, and Kathy Conway, Senior Volunteer. You're very welcome. Um, as your folks are setting up, uh, we will also like to invite uh, Representative uh, Cobbinger and uh, to come up and make your remarks, and is uh, is as Representative Consalvo. You're very welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to my colleagues in in government, the Boston City Council. I want to say thank you to you all that um made this trek out to Western Oxford this morning, um, especially to Councillor Lara uh, for setting up this meeting in her district, listening to the constituents and, and setting up this meeting, and for Councillors Murphy and Flaherty for uh, co-sponsoring today's meeting. So I'm going to be brief. I'm not reading anything. I'm just going to, I don't want to rehash what's already been said. I almost think if I take a picture of this room and send it in, that's my testimony, just to show the crowd that is here and the need, and the need. So thank you to all of you that showed up today. I will quickly talk about um, last budget. So last budget, uh, myself, Councilor Consalvo, 
and Senator Mike Rush, who's unable to be here today, put in for $250,000 for senior services. We kept it a little bit generic for Southwest Boston. Um, and we did that because of the need that we've heard from our constituents mutually. And um, when, you, when you go to the mayor's coffee hour and seniors unfortunately have to, um, for their voices to be heard, go down there with signs and things like that. It, it was really eye-opening and, and to me it was kind of sad to see. Um, but since we were awarded this money in the budget, um, it's still in the process. I used Parkway in Motion, which is a local nonprofit, as a conduit to receive the money. They typically do um, children's programming in the area, but they're a nonprofit that I know and that I trust. Um, they're not going to provide the senior services, but the money is just going to flow with them. Um, but since we received this money, the, um, the, the need or the interest from the community um, including everyone in this room today, including BCYF, including Ethos, including Emily Shea, who honestly, Emily Shea has been unbelievable um, to work with, to have conversations with. She understands the need, um, as does Ethos and every, every member of the Boston City Council that's here today. And one of the things we've discussed in the last couple of weeks, it, I guess the premise for trying to get the money was I want a place where everyone in this room and people that were unable to make it here today know that they can go every Tuesday, Thursday, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever the schedule will be, and you can go there at 10 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever the hours will be. Because I heard from seniors that BCYF does the best they can and they truly do a very good job. However, space is limited. Seniors would be told that this is their senior space Weeks later, months later, sorry, that space is now teen space. You shouldn't be bounced around. So again, the intent was $250,000, rent a great space such as the Elks or another place, um, and you know what you have. We're not going to interfere with what BCYF does. We're going to add to what they do. So you can get three to five days a week of services. You can go have a meal. You can have a cup of coffee or anything. Um, like that, that that you might want, or just to see a friend, right? Um, just a, just a meeting space. So the conversations are going very very well. Um, the Elks, who I should thank for hosting us here today, has been great. Is eager, wants to work with us, wants to work within our budget. Ethos wants to be a very strong partner. Um, the city wants to be a partner, and and I think it's a great way for us, as the community, to show there is a need, there is a want and kind of, a, to use a saying, if we build it, they will come. And we let the city know, myself, uh, Council, uh, Representative Consalvo, and Senator Rush, that we want to be partners in this process, not only with this earmark that we got for the $250,000, but also going forward. That if we can identify a space, we will make this a top priority in our future budget requests. Whatever the capital costs are going to be, we will do our best to get as much as we can and I think it's a huge opportunity for the city, the state, and as someone mentioned, private business. And we have so many around here bigger that, that we can start talking to about naming rights or things like that so we can get the space um, that you all deserve. But with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let um, my colleague, Representative Consalvo, talk. And again, thank you for everyone for coming here today. If you have questions, please contact my office. Um, grab me. It's so great to see so many uh, familiar faces again. Have a great day. Everything he said, thank you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, I want to thank our city councilors and the makers of the uh, hearing order. Always thrilled to be back testifying before the Boston City Council. Uh, as many of you know, I was an th almost 13-year member of the City Council, and I cherished my time there and so appreciate the work that they do on the City Council every day. I uh, want to also give a shout-out to my constituent, Chief Marceau, who's doing a great job for Mayor Wu uh, in his work. And also, uh, I know uh, that my colleague, Rep. Coppinger, mentioned Emily Shea, but there is no greater commissioner in anywhere in any city in the United States of America that cares more about older adults than Emily Shea, and I want to thank her for the work that she does. 
and just also a quick shout out to the team from Ethos uh, that's at the table. I mean, Ethos does so much work in our community for seniors. <laughs> and we thank you so much for your efforts there as well. And then just to thank all of you, I mean, this room is packed. Uh, they're opening up the back now right as we speak to let more people sit. Uh, this is a great crowd and I think this size crowd, and yeah, another round of applause for the Elks, by the way, for uh, hosting us here today and the great work they do for the community. And I do echo everything Rep. Coppinger said. Uh, I want to thank Rep. Coppinger. He's a humble guy. He's been in the legislature a long time. He's a, a leader, not just in the legislature, but in the West Roxbury and Rosendale and the Parkway community. And I want to thank him for taking the leadership on this issue, for initiating that earmark. You know, there are 160 reps and there are thousands of earmarks. And so to get one passed, uh, he's not giving himself enough credit for the work it takes to get that done, and I was proud to support that as a co-sponsor and proud to vote for that, but thank you, Rep. Coppinger, for your work on behalf of our seniors. Um, for me, you know, there are many friends in this uh, room from West Roxbury, and I do represent two precincts in West Roxbury, so I'm proud to be here as a state representative who represents West Roxbury as well. But also I see many faces from Rosendale and Hyde Park in this room as well. So this is an issue that affects my entire district, all of Southwest Boston, and I think it's one of the most important issues that we have out there today. And like the rep said, I stand ready as a, a sophomore state representative just starting my second term to, whatever I, to do whatever I can to be your partner, to be his partner, to be Senator Rush's partner who's also done amazing work on this at the State House and in the community to support this effort. Uh, this effort has my full support. I think uh, uh, complimenting the work that Emily Shea and her team does in BCYF to have a senior center in our community that can be a safe place that folks can go. Uh, and the stats, uh, Emily Shea riddled off all those stats about how important the social interaction is and, and the things for our older adults. Um, so couldn't be more excited to be here, couldn't be more thrilled to see the amount of people in this room and uh, look forward to being that proactive partner to continue to support whatever it takes to get us uh, over the goal line to, to make this issue happen. Happen. Um, and, and, you know, I have selfish reasons as well. In a year and a half, I'll be able to join you at that Center for Older Adults officially when I turn 55. Am, am I right, Commissioner Shea, that at 55, I'm officially by the, the stats on older adults? So I, well, that's what AARP says. I'm getting all of their stuff. So, um, but, but nonetheless, uh, have always been a strong supporter of our older adults and will continue to do so, working with our great elected leadership and all of you in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both for your leadership and your s tremendous support of this project. Um, now we'll go to the um, non-governmental, non-city organizations. Um, so who's up? Um, Val? Sure. Um, thank, thank you, Chair, Chair Braden, and thank you, uh, Councilor Lara, for your leadership on this. Councilor Mejia, Councilor Flaherty, Louis Jean, thank you all for being here, and thank you all for being here. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Valerie Frias. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Ethos. I will speak with my yelling at my children voice. Is that better? Um, I, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Ethos. We are an older adult and uh, disability services organization based out of Jamaica Plain, but we serve all of Southwest Boston. So Mattapan, Hyde Park, Roslindale, Jamaica Plain, and of course, West Roxbury. Uh, some of you have been to many of our events that have been held here in the Elks, so another shout out for the Elks for hosting uh, our Oktoberfest, our Thanksgiving event for cooking for our Thanksgiving event for those who are um, homebound. So thank you, a big thank you to the Elks and to everyone um, in this room for being here today. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about what we do first, but I, I think based on the questions from the counselors, if it's okay with Councilor Lar, I'll, I'll switch around and go to a couple of my, my um, previous lives to talk a little bit maybe about the nuts and bolts that have come up uh, here today and, and perhaps throw some ideas out. Um, and as the, the chair probably knows being from Alston Brighton, I, uh, I, I ran the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation for several years and um, part of East Boston and part of, of uh, some of these locations is in fact luck of geography and that's, um, that's simply the way some of these things are structured. So in, in Alston Brighton, for example, we had Harvard, uh, New Balance, and St. Elizabeth's all developing at the same time. Uh, and they all uh, came with them significant community benefits. So um, that, is a, that is a real 
piece of this that um, certainly benefited East Boston. Um, but, but I also want to say that I can actually work here in West Roxbury, right? I was, I was taking down notes, and that's part of why you see lots of scribble um, as, as we were talking, because the ideas for funding um, were coming through my head. So linkage funds, for instance, IDP funds uh, are out there uh, potentially for use. Uh, but also, you do actually have two hospital facilities that are subject to the Department of Public Health here. So you have um, Faulkner on a border, and you have uh, Hebrew Senior. So uh, both of those are subject to a process with the Department of Public Health called determination of need. And I'm sorry this is a little bit technical, but the point of all this is that whenever they make any significant change to their facility or an addition, they are actually required by the state to provide community benefits. And those benefits are supposed to be in the immediate um, vicinity of uh, where that impact is. Yeah. So uh, again, this is maybe not a today issue, but as those things happen, those are ways, um, you know, buildings, apartment buildings get developed. You work with a developer to perhaps use the, the ground floor instead of as retail as the community benefit to the city as a, as a community space that, that can be used. So there are some creative ways. They don't happen overnight, but they do happen with the community that's here uh, and, and, and others coming together and, and um, making sure not to advocate just here today, but at all of those community meetings along the way. So, uh, you know, I, I'll answer you. I, I was also the capital council at the uh, state level. So uh, to the extent our reps are still here, thank you to our state reps. There are bond bills that move. Um, so any earmarks and bond bills are also um, helpful. Again, just like the, the city's capital budget, getting into that bond bill is only stage one. You then need to actually get on the capital plan and get funded. But it is a stage, a step along the way. So, I, you know, I would... I would um, recommend that everyone here at the council level, but everyone here in the community, because it has to be a full community effort, um, work at both the state and the city level and the private enterprise level, the nonprofit level, because all together is how um, we get this done. So in the meantime, right, while we're waiting for all these other things to happen, and while we're not just waiting, working hard for all these other things to happen, I want to tell you about Ethos, because I, I do think that we need to make sure that we're doing a uh, substantial amount of programming and doing right by our, uh, our older adults uh, and our disabled adults in the community. So uh, we are a private nonprofit. We are in our 50th year. Uh, like I said, we're based in Jamaica Plain. We serve over 8,000 adults daily. Um, so we are, we are out and about across the city of Boston. While our home care and some of our other services are focused here in Southwest Boston, throughout the city, uh, we run the, the city's Meals on Wheels program, for instance. Uh, currently, we do about 9,000 meals a day. At the height of the pandemic, we were doing about 12,000 meals a day. Um, so I wanna talk about a little bit about the pandemic and what the pandemic showed um, in our programming. So uh, social isolation, of, of course, um, happened overnight in terms of um, both restrictions and, and fear about the pandemic, real fear about the pandemic before um, vaccines were available. And food insecurity was one of those uh, initial issues that really um, came out as uh, something that, was, that for, for seniors in particular, were really living on the edge with their food insecurity. And, and uh, we became a lifeline to several thousand uh, additional seniors uh, in that regard. And so that's one piece of that. And I, you know, and that, I, I, I mentioned that because during the pandemic, our Meals on Wheels drivers were, uh, for many folks, their one contact with another individual um, a day. Uh, and, and so when we talk about being in community and need for being in community, I just wanna reflect on why, why we need that community, right? And, and what happened during the pandemic. That said, to my right is um, my colleague, Ray Santos, and uh, his team are here. They're scattered about, and you probably know many of them. Uh, they run several programs, and several of them here in West Roxbury that are evidence-based, they're social, everything from Tai Chi uh, to yoga to you know, the, those bigger social events with dancing and, and um, just fun gathering, um, informational events with speakers, uh, conversations on aging and the like, uh, and those that had always been done in community, his team worked um, diligently to convert essentially overnight to uh, an online model. Uh, 
we learned a lot with that online model. First of all, we learned that uh, we had a lot of gaps, right? We had a lot of gaps in terms of uh, elders who had access to digital devices and who could use them. Uh, we had language issues. We had, um, there was a, a big disparity in the BIPOC community. Uh, we needed to address all of these things. And the, you know, the pandemic, for all the harm that it's done, um, has made us better at addressing issues of, um, of barriers, uh, again, relative to, to language, to socioeconomic status, neighborhood, um, and, and, and the like. And Ray's team has done um, yeoman's work in terms of making sure that those, those communities um, are, are not invisible and are, are quite visible and become part of all the work that we do. And um, as, as the commissioner said, we wanna make sure that there's equity in all that we do in terms of our programming. And um, I, you know, I wanna thank Ray and, and his team for, for centering equity at, at the fore of all the programming that we do. Um, we have a, a village model and you know, it's something perhaps to think about here. Um, and I wanna thank Rep Coppinger for um, the money that, that he got earmarked. Uh, but in Jamaica Plain, for instance, and there are folks from West Roxbury and Roslindale and other parts of the city who attend, there's a village model that doesn't have a single home, it moves around a bit, um, but they are a very close-knit community who have found different ways to do book clubs and um, meals together and things like that um, that, I, that I think um, is, a, you know, is another pathway um, and, and as Commissioner Shea said, we need to find pathways until we find buildings. So we need to make sure that the programming is um, robust and um, serves the community. So I wanted to just put that out there as, an, uh, as a possibility for um, how we sort of connect a little bit more in, in West Roxbury. Um, I am going on a little bit on this, but um, I, I did want to say that uh, while the, the convening in person is so incredibly meaningful and important for so many. I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that um, we actually touched many seniors for the first time during the pandemic because they couldn't access programming that was happening here because of ability or disability issues, language, things like that. So I wanna make sure that, um, that we also maintain a, a uh, a virtual presence for those who either can't or, um, or or just choose not to come out to an event because I want to make sure that we're not missing any seniors, right? So I want to make sure that we have the spaces available for being in community, but also that we're able to serve those who for whatever reason are not able um, to, to be in community. And, and we learned how to do that well and I want to make sure that we maintain um, that presence as well. Um, someone had asked about mental health, so I'm jumping a little bit around about what we do, but we, um, we run two mental health programs and they are um, tremendously impactful and have doubled in size since the pandemic. I forget, I'm sorry, which counselor asked about it, but um, both mental health programs have doubled in size since the pandemic began. And that's, uh, you know, that's not a coincidence. One of them is the Elder Mental Health Outreach Team and that's uh, where we get a call and we uh, work intensively with an elder who uh, is in crisis. And the other is our uh, suicide prevention. And uh, we do both uh, suicide depression as well as substance abuse uh, work in that program. And these are tremendously beneficial to uh, older, older adults. I think that um, you know, folks don't necessarily talk about mental health um, challenges that are facing older Americans and, and at Ethos we want to make sure that we never lose sight of all aspects of, um, of health. Physical health and mental health are all health. We want to make sure that we're addressing all of those. So um, I have gone on enough. Um, there's a list of what we do out there. We do uh, money management, we do counseling for Medicare. Um, but again, I think that the most fun um, that we have is with all of you when we're out here in community. Uh, I think one of our Tai Chi instructors is back there and, and has, has had several of you uh, in, in class. Um, so I look forward to continuing this conversation. I look forward to partnering with Rep Coppinger on um, the earmarked funds that, that he has available for this community. I look forward to partnering with all of you and uh, with the council and of course with Age Strong in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ray Santos. I'm the Chief Development and Community Relations Officer for Ethos. Um, just to echo, um, you know, Val's comments, and de definitely want to thank the Boston City Council, uh, H. Strong Commission, Chief Masso, uh, Mayor Wu, and all those uh, Rep. Coppinger, uh, Mike, um, Mike Rush, and Rob Consalvo, and all those who have been working on these issues for so long. Um, I heard the. Um, a number this morning that sort of struck a chord with me, um, 15. So 15 years ago, uh, a group of community residents started working on, uh, uh, on the development uh, of a, c a community center. 15 years ago, Ethos uh, um, f um, commissioned a needs assessment um, and spoke to many of the community members in this room, um, and, you know, which led to the development of AgeWell West Roxbury. And that is our flagship health and wellness program. It provides um, health and wellness, exercise, uh, socialization opportunities for seniors throughout West Roxbury and beyond. It's become a beacon for so many um, you know, it, throughout the community. Uh, I, so many folks come from all over the city of Boston to partake in, in, in Age Well West Roxbury um, programming. Um, I can speak a little bit to the need in the community. Coming out of the pandemic, we saw tremendous demand for activity, um, health and wellness programming, getting together with their friends and, and neighbors in a safe space. Um, we, Age Well West Roxbury utilizes all of the assets that a community has. It uses community rooms, rooms like this room, the um, um, Boston police um, stations, uh, senior housing locations, wherever the, there is an opportunity to be as close to seniors as possible. And that's our goal. We don't want you traveling very far. We want you to come in and enjoy you know, the work that we do. Um, so we try to be a, a, as close to consumers as possible. I can speak to the need that um, it is a challenge for us to find um, the amount of space that, um, that we need to provide the programming that we're capable of. Um, and I, I'm gonna, I'll keep my remarks brief because I want to hear you know, from, from um, my, my fellow panelists and from you all. Um, Ethos is you know, a ready, willing, and able to provide a, an expanded set of programming and meet the needs of the community, um, but we need your voice to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Jan next? Or Kathy? Jan. Jan. Yes, I needed to get my glasses on. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jan Hamilton, and um, I have been a lifelong resident of the city of Boston. During my early years through high school, I lived in the Mission Hill area of Roxbury. For the past 50 plus years, I have lived here in West Roxbury. Throughout my career, I have worked in the city of Boston. Um, I am here today as a representative of the Parkway Seniors. We've got a new name for ourselves, the Parkway Seniors, to ask for your assistance in and commitment to securing a building in the Parkway area dedicated to providing services for seniors. This senior center would serve, <coughs> excuse me, residents of West Roxbury, Roslindale, Hyde Park, and the surrounding communities. Um, before I go any further, because I I'm, I'm need to do what I read here, um, but some of it has already been said, and that is because there's thank yous that need to go around this whole room. It is absolutely awesome. We are so thrilled with so many of you, the seniors and people in the audience that were able to come out for this because we all know there is a need. So um, before I any more ado, before I go further, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the many individuals and organizations for their help during the past year. Specifically, I want to thank Boston City Councilors Kendra Lara, Michael Flaherty, and Ruth Z. Lejeune uh, for sponsoring the hearing in West Roxbury rather than in City Hall, because I think we all know that we couldn't get this, we couldn't get all of us into City Hall. It's just not, it's just not possible. Um, I would like to thank Representative Ed Carpenter and Senator Mike Rush for securing funding in the state budget. I would like to thank Ethos for their continued support and provision of services. 
thank you to the Age Strong Commission for their assistance with the budget and their services also um, uh, to, the, to the programs that have existed for years at the Roach Community Center and more recently the Orenberger Community Center um, but our space got taken away from us there. We used to have a nice yoga class there and the space got needed for, uh, for a teen center there. Um, um, so, and thank, thank you to all the senior, uh, without all of this help, we would not be here today. We are very, very grateful to have everybody here today. Thank you so much. I do want to mention just at this time with this particular group that uh, there, there are four people actually on this committee and someone um, mentioned her before, but Val Davis was the secretary of our group, and it was myself and Kathy Conway and Mary Rice. The four of us have been working almost just about a full year now on, on getting this project done. So I owe, uh, you know, congratulations and thank you for your support, Mary, Mary Rice and Val Davis. A little bit about the background information and uh, specific need and again some of this is going to be a repeat from what others have said because I didn't know that they were going to be talking about some of the things here and all I can do today is read here today I can't I can't I have to read what the words are in front of me <clears throat> the conversation about a senior center in this area actually began under the Menino administration it became more focused over a year ago when we were able to gather after COVID we had approximately two to 300 signatures on the petitions for a senior center. The petitions were submitted to Mayor Wu's office and Council Lara's office. Currently, there are three senior centers, standalone senior centers within the city of Boston. One is in Dorchester, one in Charlestown, and a brand new center in East Boston. These locations are not accessible to the seniors of our area which is Southwest Boston. There is nothing in this particular area. West Roxbury alone has 9,000, thank you for the information, Council, Council Lara, uh, uh, 9,000 seniors, which is 27% of the total population of West Roxbury. So if you think about that, that's more than a quarter of the percent of West Roxbury, 27%. It, it, it is seniors. Um, the, these statistics do not include information about the numbers of seniors living in Hyde Park, Roslindale, Jamaica Plain, in any place else that they would come, um, that they would come to a center if it were over here. Um, with, the, with the center, uh, the new center, these here are must with the new senior center. It needs to be handicapped accessible, it needs to be accessible to public transportation, and it needs to have sufficient parking. That's really, um, that's it that we really, really need. Uh, more details on the needs of the, of the history. While many programs are currently offered at the Roach Community Center, uh, the Orenberg Community Center to a lesser degree, and the police station, we are dependent on the availability of space in these centers. Because these centers are also used for summer school activities, um, we're really limited with what we can have during the summer. Um, and, um, other activities, um, at the, especially at the Orenberger, because where it is a school uh, BCYF site, uh, it gets very limited there with, with what we can have there. Um, and again, uh, uh, we can't find space for programs, especially during the summer and school vacations. Uh, the need for a senior center now is even more crucial than it was three years ago. The recent COVID pandemic has caused significant isolation and loneliness for the senior population and serves to highlight the need for a permanent, for a permanent home, a permanent location, a permanent home. We as seniors need and thrive on the opportunity to gather together at the various programs or to just use it as a drop-in location. This includes activities such as yoga, tai chi, dance, wellness classes, mahjong, memory classes, etc. These services enable us to remain in our homes and participate in our community. Once we secure a senior center in the Parkway area, there will be many more opportunities for seniors to attend scheduled events and also, more importantly, enable us to develop more friendships. All of this will enhance the quality of our lives during our golden years. Uh, we want to thank you for your support for the support you have shown thus far and ask that you continue to keep 
a senior center in the Parkway area as a top priority. If you build it, we will come. And somebody else, somebody else said it before me, but that's, that's what's written here. And uh, <laughs> so that's it for me. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Jan. Um, Kathy, uh, would you like to say a few words? Um, okay. um, we have a long list of, um, of you wonderful folks who have signed up to make some speak uh, and in support of this, so uh, we'll, we'll get to you very shortly. Thank you. Kathy All right. Conway. All right. Much of what I said has already <laughs> been said. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Conway. I am a lifelong resident of the city of Boston. I was born and raised in Jamaica Plain and have resided in Rosendale for the past 52 years. I would like to thank the city officials and the members of the audience for coming today to hear our hopes and dreams for a senior center in the Parkway area, a place for seniors to call their own. The Parkway area is home to over 9,000 seniors, representing 27% of the population. It's the second largest concentration of seniors in any Boston neighborhood. While we would like to thank the BCYF facilities at the Roach Center and Orenberger community for having some activities for us, the space and time available for these activities is severely limited. They are not available to seniors during school vacations. This means a total shutdown, not just for a week, but then for the entire summer. During these periods, space is used for activities for the youth of the area. Having limited space and time available to us means that there is no place for seniors to drop in, to have conversation, and perhaps a cup of coffee with other seniors. Many of the seniors live alone and perhaps are not physically able to participate in the yoga or tai chi classes. They are completely forgotten. Having one place to call home would save seniors from having to travel between sites and avoid time conflicts. According to the National Council for Aging, the availability of a senior center significantly delays the onset of chronic disease. It improves the physical, social, and emotional well-being of seniors. It improves their life, their quality of life. Seniors need a senior center, one that would be available five or six days a week for 52 weeks a year. This center should have ample space to conduct classes, hold meetings and lectures, and just gather for conversation and socializing. It should have ample parking and be totally handicapped accessible. It should have a kitchen area suitable for preparing at least small amounts of food and coffee. Some of the activities it would be utilized for would be yoga, tai chi, binga size, balance class, line dancing, tech support, guest speakers. And perhaps it would serve as a focal point for arranging a trip, uh, a day trip a few times a year. Thinking ahead, perhaps it could offer a noontime meal, either free or at a limited cost. I know this is done in many senior centers. This would encourage socialization and provide some seniors with, perhaps, their sole healthy meal of the day. In closing, I would like to thank everyone for their attendance and for our elected elected officials in the audience, we hope this will provide the impetus for finding a permanent home for our seniors in the Parkway area. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Kathy, for your incredible leadership and uh, all the effort you've put into this, um, this process so far. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to switch now uh, with, my, with my colleagues' permission. I really want to hear from the public at this point, all of you folks who have turned up this morning. Um, I will, I, we have a long list of people who have uh, requested to speak. I would like to start with uh, Laurie Rudman. Radman? Radwin. Radwin, yeah. Radwin. Beg your pardon. I may re mispronounce your name if... Uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> um, so, 
Oh, and could you please, uh, we have a long list, so if you could please limit your comments to about two minutes, I'd really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, would you just, the, just use the hook. Okay, so um, good morning, councillors and distinguished panel members. Um, I'm seeing a lot of friends in the room, JP at home, the swimming pool at Flaherty, um, BCYF. Uh, I can't list them all, the coalition. Um, but what I want to say besides, oh, and the birthday girl, there's a secret birthday girl. Um, having a brick and mortar senior center is a benefit to our seniors and to the gerontology nurses, gerontology nurses of the future. When I taught it at UMass Boston in the nursing program, I was in the hospital, acute care, but my faculty colleagues taught in community health clinics in senior centers. During their 10-week rotation, they delivered holistic care to homebound elders under the supervision of faculty for free. There were placements in Malden and Norwell and Arlington and cities other than Boston because, oh, they, they were at the Pine Street Inn, um, because there was no brick and mortar um, uh, senior center. And it had to be brick and mortar so that students could serve in other ways, hold clinical conference, promote, uh, provide educational offerings for the staff, um, provide programs for the seniors and the like. And the pharmacy faculty would do a brown bag day uh, regularly uh, in the um, semester. This is a win-win-win. And in the future, should this center come to pass, I would be happy to serve in an advisory capacity to explore possible university senior center collaborations. And um, I, I think I'm gonna live till when it, Built because my mom's going to be 101 next month, so I think I've got the genes. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Richard Gormley, and then um, just going down the line, and then followed by Mary Mullen. If you could be ready to come up, that would be great. Richard, the Lord Mayor of West Roxbury. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody showing up. West Roxbury today <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to officially welcome the Boston City Council for coming to West Roxbury thank you very much I'll have to check your passport to make sure you got <laughs> uh, get over the border all right but uh, this is a great community and we deserve a great place now I understand the problems I've been listening to all the backup and the feedback but uh, just want to let the city of Boston know uh, that I am also the president of the, uh, the Boston Irish Social Club. Uh, we have, uh, we're a nonprofit club. We have our own building, which is three times the size of this hall. My fire law for the city of Boston is close to 700 people. Uh, and our hall is available for rent for any occasion, whether it be a, a meeting or uh, a bap uh, baptism after uh, after party for any event, birthday parties, weddings, whatever. We have over 700 chairs in our hall uh, right now, and uh, we would like to uh, offer our facility, if you accept our premise, uh, for uh, a short amount of rent uh, to help out the city of Boston. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So we'll have Mary Mullen next. And uh, Jeannie, is it Jeannie Black? You'll be next after Mary. And then Pat Alvarez. We'll just get everybody lined up. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. When I worked for the Children's Museum in Boston as the controller, I had the responsibility of moving them downtown. We never lost anything out of collections. Everything was marked, everything was prepared. But we also put a limit on when the developers would finish the job. So I think so that we don't see any 15 years, that when the developers do get involved and a site is found, that we will put limitations on a lot of things. Thank you. Thank you.
Jeannie, um, I understand Pat Alvarez has, has left. Um, the next after Jeannie, Dennis Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick? Okay. Well. Good morning, City Councilors and neighbors. A lot of you are friends whose faces I know. Uh, my name is Jean Black. I live on the last street of West Roxbury in the upper Washington Street corridor in what is commonly thought of as the distaff side of West Roxbury. Um, this hearing was called to evaluate the need for a senior center in West Roxbury, which has been a long issue of many, many decades even. My late mother, Martha Black, known to many in the community, spoke often on the need for a senior center. At nearly 97, she was still driving, including weekly trips to the Norwood Senior Center, where she was a member, because our neighborhood did not have a center. Um, my remarks going forward are as a devil's advocate, and God knows everyone needs one. As a professional, I've managed numerous projects from inception to conclusions. None was simple, all required planning, commitment to a budget, regular updates, reassessment, and starting a restart with different parameters, much as Mary Malloy, Malloy just said. These are major considerations for any project, and if, which is a big if, the entire council and mayor approve the recommendation that I expect from this gathering, there are numerous steps, including finding a site, determining its suitability, developing a design, estimating costs and security, securing funding. A project such as this will require the commitment and coordination of numerous city departments. Councilor Lara has already spoken to many of these things as well as, as the other councilors. The steps I de identify as having the most impediments are citing. We know there's no vacant lots in West Roxbury. Will this be a ground up project or will it involve retrofitting a building? Will it be completely ADA compliant with accessibility for individuals with mobility and other disabilities? Will there be ample safe parking, which is critical? There will be various vehicles, including personal cars, vans, and other accessible, um, <coughs> excuse me, modes of transportation. Will it be near the bus? Uh, very critical will be staffing and scheduling as key, as well as partnerships with organizations like Ethos, the VNA, and others who deal with the geriatric population. As for 2003, it's my understanding that the city budget is being finalized within the next couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, the mayor announced a $25 million line item for North End's new BCYF center. That figure is probably a ballpark estimate of what it will cost to bring a center to West Roxbury. I doubt that the process will proceed quickly and smoothly. I hope I'm, it's not true. Uh, personally, though, I have doubts, and I'll give you a, an example, a very specific example. Um, actually, I would like to ask Chief Bassa, if he's here, to take this one to heart. Um, the Mary Draper Pool House, near my house, which is managed by the Boston Centers for Youth and Families, underwent $3.5 million in serious renovations beginning in, at the end of Mayor Menino's term in 2013. It was reopened with great fanfare by Mayor Marty Walsh in 2017. Uh, it, for those of you who know it, it's a standalone building that was built from ground up, and I don't believe it's more than 30 years old, if that. Um, it was closed during the pandemic. I got a hip replacement after the pandemic, and I could have used that ability to go to the pool. More recently, it closed on June 1st, last summer, for unspecified or repairs with an unspecified cost. It's supposed to reopen this summer. That means for the past five years, it's been closed more often than it's been open. Now, I know 
from anecdotal information that many of my neighbors who are senior citizens went to that pool and enjoyed it, and also for the therapeutic results. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I hope going forward that uh, we'll have more meetings and others will be able to express their opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis. Dennis Kirkpatrick and uh, see who's next, just to get you online. Um, Connie, what's this one? Connie? Connie? Connie Caruso. Connie Caruso will be next after Dennis. Thank you. You have the floor, Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is <coughs> Dennis Kirkpatrick. I live in Rosendale. <coughs> Pardon me. There seems to be a lot of that going around this winter. <laughs> Um, I'm here representing myself to support a senior center in the Parkway District. I'm also here to speak on behalf of a organization known as the Roslindale Community School Council. Most people don't know who that is or what it is, but at one time there were organizations like us throughout the city of Boston. In fact, there were at least 30 of us citywide. Uh, unfortunately, in the post-pandemic uh, period, there are only a handful of us left, and only those of us that were rather strong and well-organized and well-supported uh, are still around. Um, I am not an um, uh, employee of the City of Boston, and I am not qualified to speak on behalf of the City of Boston, but our program <laughs> operates at the Rosendale Community Center, and that building reopened on December the 19th. It opened very quietly, uh, after very close to three years of closure. Um, as part of that renovation process to repair it after some serious internal water damage, the city acquired the registry of motor vehicle space which occupied a good piece of that building. The registry of motor vehicles is not returning there and it is my understanding and unfortunately Commissioner Rivera could not be here today from BCYF it is my understanding that the overall plan is to turn that into a senior space. Uh, I would estimate that space is probably about, oh, about 50% the size of this room. It has its own entrance, an ADA ramp. It has its own restrooms. It does not have a kitchen, but that can be overcome a little bit, and it's certainly on several major bus lines. Uh, so that might be an interim solution for consideration until such time as a building is built just for seniors. Uh, the, the, uh, if I understand, uh, Commissioner Emily, there has been some discussion about that. Am I correct? Um, so I would just point out that uh, Ann Siegel is here. Oh, Ann. Yeah. Are you going to talk, Ann? I'm here listening. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ann, Ann Siegel is our administrative coordinator. Yeah, Ann Siegel is our administrative coordinator at the building. Uh, one of the blessings we have at that particular building. And so um, I would suggest that might be a consideration for the city council to consider. Also, um, our organization is a qualified 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, there was discussion here with Representative Coppinger earlier regarding uh, state funding. Our corporation channels a substantial amount of money back into the community from the state and from uh, private uh, enterprise into various programs. So aside from our child care program uh, that channels uh, money from the state uh, to supplement after school programming, uh, we work in partnership with the youth swim team at the Flaherty Pool. Uh, we channel about $15,000 through their uh, income, which goes back into the swim team every year. Uh, certainly, we get city core grants, C-O-R-E, um, et cetera. We're also qualified to take federal money direct. We have an existing uh, cage code and are qualified and are listed with them to do both children's programs and senior programs. So uh, if we had to work something out, we are a qualified nonprofit to be the fiscal sponsor to channel those funds immediately in-house. I previously discussed my words today before this uh, committee uh, with my own board of directors and they are in support. So I would uh, welcome any dialogue with the city of Boston moving forward uh, to see what we can do to support that. 
It would be a good place as a template for senior programming, work out best practices. We are also not bound by a city RFP and other contractual restrictions. We have an existing vendor list, we buy local. And so we have, uh, we think we check a lot of boxes that might be able to help uh, develop. And of course, we're on about five different bus lines that serve West Roxbury. So that would be about it. If anybody has any questions of me after, I'll make myself available. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Connie. So we have Connie, um, and then we'll have Dot Valenti next after Connie. I am Connie Caruso, lifelong Bosendale resident, and uh, I would like to um, say that the opportunity to get together with other people. First, I found Ethos. From Ethos, we found all kinds of other organizations and exercises, but we're going from the community center in Bosendale to the Orenburger to the Roach Center, and we go on and on, and th there'd be a great place to come to sit, and after our classes or exercises or whatever we did, we'd be able to sit down and get to know each other even better. Because I think you, you, you get through and we all walk off. So it would be wonderful to have a community center. But thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, Dot Valenti. And then I think it's Ed Conley will be next. Good morning. I see a lot of familiar faces here this morning. I don't know how much I can add to what's been, what's already been said this morning, except to say that certainly would be available to me or living alone, being a widow, as most of us, a lot of us can attribute to, that having a place. Um, the Roach Center and the Orenberger have been very, very, attentive to us. Um, obviously, their first priority is children, which it should be, so that when the children take over, um, we lose. And that's something that we can't avoid. But as far as I'm concerned, a place, as uh, Kathy just said, a place to be able to just sit and be with people um, is, I think, paramount in our lives as, as far as seniors are concerned. And that 15 year space really, that scares me because I'll be 100 by then and I don't think <laughs> I'll care by then. But um, I think um, everybody should think about it and I'd like to know what the panel thinks that we as a general population could do to help. I mean, we're, we're willing to do it, we just need some guidance. Plus the fact, um, my last statement would be that eventually, when the senior center center is built, you'll all be able to use it. <laughs> Thank you. Is it Ed Conley? Uh, am I mis getting the name right? And then. Yeah. The name is Red. Marilyn McNabb. And is it? Carol Foley? No? Is there an Ed here that signed up this week? Is there an Ed? I'm not able to read, read the second name. Okay, on to the next one. Marilyn McNabb. I'd just like to uh, let you know that President Flynn has joined us from City Council. Judy Jose, Jose Rodi. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you to the council for having this meeting. Um, I am a West Roxbury resident. I am a senior citizen. And I have worked uh, providing and coordinating services for seniors in the Southwest Boston area for the last 18 years. Prior to that, I did the same thing in Cambridge. 
In Cambridge, they have um, and had all through that time a very vibrant senior center. So I've been able to work in two different areas and sort of see the difference of, of what that looks like. In West Roxbury, um, I have to give kudos to Ethos because there's an awful lot of programming here, as you all know, and they do a fabulous job of finding spaces for that. Um, and we have some great spaces. We have the Roach Center, we have the Orenberger, we have the police department. And I also see a real benefit to integrating seniors with other members of the population, families and children. And I think that that should be noted. And when, as much as I think that we absolutely need to have a senior center here, I think when they evaluate what they need at the senior center, they should look at those other spaces and say, what works really well in those other spaces? And what do we need specifically in our own senior center that's different? Um, so that maybe there's a, there's a little a money saving business that we can do when we build the new center. If we don't have to build a gymnasium, for example, if we can use the gymnasium someplace else. Um, so I, that's one of the things that I would suggest. Um, so we're talking about as, as a Representative Coppinger said, supplementing existing programming to some extent. Um, and then some of the other specific things that I would like to see that actually may cost more money would be to access new technology specifically to address needs of seniors. Like there is brilliant new technology to address hearing. There are tables and wiring that can go around rooms so that um, people can hear what is being said. Uh, we we <laughs> witnessed it this morning when we just started the hearing today about how difficult it is for people all around the room to be able to hear someone who's speaking. So there's that. Um, and going beyond just accessibility to universal design. Um, so these are things that I would like to see incorporated if we are gonna build a new building. Um, and the whole idea of dementia friendly, I think, is, is also crucial. And that is in terms of making people safe when they walk around so that outdoor spaces are enclosed and people can get around, people can find their way back, wayfinding. Um, they can get back without getting lost and, and all in a tizzy about it. So those are some of the ideas I have about what the new building might look like. The other thing um, that I noted when I think it was Val was speaking about ways to fund some of this, um, and she talked about Faulkner and Hebrew Rehab. Faulkner is in the midst of a huge development right now, and I don't know whether those earmarked funds have already been spent or, or earmarked the things for um, benefiting the community, but that's something that I would love to have looked at. So thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one more thing, putting on my other hat. Member of the Stratford Street United Club, uh, United Church, which hosts uh, Rose's Bounty Food Pantry, we are in the midst of a big renovation and we are going to, this fall, have brand new, fully renovated space that will be accessible, fully accessible um, with bathrooms and access to a kitchen. So we would like to offer up that uh, for consideration of space, at least in the meantime, if not ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we will have Bill Hob and uh, followed by Brenda Breen. Thank you all. Good to see everybody. I wear many hats. First of all, I have an eyesight disability, which means I get fantastic service from Ethos. Take advantage of it. I get cleaning service. I could get Meals on Wheels from three different vendors and phenomenal transportation for medical visits. I also serve on the H. Strong Commission's Mayor Wu's Senior Advisory Council. All the gentlemen who are in this room get on the committee. I'm a minority because I'm one of the few men on the committee. <laughs> I'm also an accessibility consultant and I represent the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. We offer in-person technology training at both the Natick Senior Center and the Brookline Senior Center, and also remotely. We would like to partner with the city 
to bring this program across the city. There are spaces available in the Boston Public Library. I have recently met with the Boston Public Library's accessibility team to improve the services. I've also recently met with the Brigham and Women's Hospital to improve that. If you are a patient, you got a complaint, speak up, call patient relations. They do listen. They really do listen. I'm very lucky, even with this eyesight. And I've also taken the Age Strong Commission on a tour of the sidewalks of West Roxbury. Speak up, please, because the sidewalks are a mess. Also, believe it or not, H. Strong Commission offers limited medical transportation. 617-635-3000. You don't remember the number, just call 311. The folks at 311 are fabulous. They will connect you with any city department you need services. I'm very lucky. And I also represent a company based in Philadelphia that provides online pharmacy and accessible pharmacy, and they offer services that Walgreens and CVS will never offer. Thank you very much for listening. Speak up. And by the way, there is a place where the city can build a temporary senior center in 120 days, and I know where it is. Thank you, Bill. So, Brenda Breen and then uh, Patrice Gattuzzi. Brenda? Um, no, hi, my name is Carolyn Breen. My mother seated oh, um, excellent. the floor Thank to me. Oh, excellent, thank you. So I um, grew up in West Roxbury. My mother's lived here for 50 years. And um, uh, I thank you for the opportunity, counselors, to speak. And I, I'm working as a president of the Highland Neighborhood Civic Association here in West Roxbury as well. And I'm, I've been happy to hear how many different people are offering locations for a senior center. Um, whether permanent or temporary locations, and that's wonderful. And I was a little surprised, I guess, early on in the meeting when there was so much discussion about where is the money um, going to come from, because I recall back in October, um, the city council, I mean, I, I believe you put the budget together, and $60 million was set aside for the Grove Hall, um, a full-service youth center in Grove Hall in Dorchester. And I'm hoping that, like, a small fraction of that type of of that amount, not of that money, but of that amount that the city council, like even, I don't think anyone here is even talking about $6 million, but that would be only one-tenth of what was set aside. So I, I beseech the city council, like um, I'm reminded of when my fifth grade teacher, Sister Mary Ellen David, used to say, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm hoping that the city council will find, like obviously there's a will, um, and there's people, hundreds of people here who would benefit from that, and I hope you have the will and can find a way to find the money that's needed for the Senior Center. Thank, Thank you. you. Patrice, and then we'll have Carol Connors. Okay, good morning. Thank you, counselors, for being here. I really appreciate it. My name is Patrice Gatozzi. I live in Hyde Park, and um, I just retired. I was working at Ethos, and I will uh, reiterate what Ethos does. We bring programming all over the city in every nook and cranny. And so, uh, but I had the privilege of being the coordinator for all the meals, congregate meal sites all across the city. So I got to see seniors everywhere and go to the Brighton Senior Center, the uh, Charlestown Senior Center, and what were the other ones? But anyway, I think what I take from that is just the, the place to call home. And you know, not everybody can meet the same time to go to the programming, but they might have had a doctor's appointment, but they want to come in and have a cup of coffee and talk to their friends. And I think that is so important that we have a place that we can call home in this area of the city. And I was going to use that phrase, if there's a will, there's a way, because uh, seniors need to be our priority. And I, I mean, we love children, but our seniors are a priority. And I think that's uh, what I want to reiterate and just thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Next up, Carol Connors and uh, followed by James Reddy. Is Carol available? 
No? Okay. GM's ready? Can you, can you repeat the name, Councilor Reyna? Okay. And uh, Vincent Finn? Okay. The, I think the way to cut to this is anyone who wishes to speak who hasn't had an opportunity to speak, please come forward, introduce yourself, and we'll give you the floor just to move it along. Thank you so much. There's a, you said a Carol name. Can you say that name one more time? Carol. Good morning, and thank you for the city councillors for your time and my neighbours. Connors. My name is Vincent Finn. I live on Richwood Street, and I've been in West Oxford 50 plus years. Um, I want to just say that when my mail comes, I'm always intrigued by AARP, who now call everybody 55 years old a senior citizen. So I don't know if that works its way into the statistics. Um, I think, feas you know, feasibly, finding a place in West Roxbury to build from scratch a senior centre is it's going to take a long time, based on some of the developments that we've seen for housing and what have you. So just to piggyback on Richie Gormley's kind offer for the Irish Social Club, I wonder if the committee would consider um, here in St. Teresa's Parish, where we have a convent and the large house that the priests lived in, may or may, I don't speak for the parish, but may or may not be available for rental. Um, the convent would be ideal for short term. Um, if the city could enter into some kind of a three or five year rental with the parish, um, it has everything um, that you would need. It's next to a school where lots of children can mix with our elders, which is just one of the components they need. Um, and as I said, piggybacking on Richie's offer for the Irish Social Club, it might satisfy one of the things you're looking for, which is an instant space, easily negotiated, I would imagine. The money's in the budget. You don't have to wait 15 years. You could wait as short or as long as you want to do. And just explore. Is that feasible? Thank you. Thank you. Next up, could you introduce yourself? Let us know who you are. Yeah, hi, my name is Mary Gorman. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Boston. Um, so last week, the mayor announced that she had parcels of land that she was going to give to the developers. My understanding is there are a couple in West Roxbury or the area. Why can't we get one of those? Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Howard Mintz. I'm a resident of uh, West Roxbury, prior to that Jamaica Plain. I'd like to thank the elected officials for being here and department heads. I'm a uh, retired department head from a different city. Uh, some years back, under uh, Mayor Walsh was having a community fair, and I talked to somebody from the Elder Affairs Commission about why there wasn't a senior citizen center. And she said to me, well, the reason was we're putting our resources and money into youth, not, not senior citizens, which I didn't find uh, particularly acceptable. And it, it's difficult to hear about 15 years, uh, especially when you're a senior citizen, and uh, even though I'm in denial about it, but uh, <laughs> 15 years is a, is a long, is a long time. And I'm sure if it was a priority, a, a, a strong priority with the current administration, if the re-election depended on getting ahead of that schedule, from my municipal experience, it would happen. It, it would happen. And one of the things that bothers me is um, I travel around rural areas in Massachusetts, Montana to go fishing. And one horse towns, these small towns, I walk into, what do they have? Senior citizen centers. They're all over. And here we are in West Roxbury, taxpayers, people who've worked hard, and we don't have a senior citizen center. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jill Hemian and I am the Director of Community Relations at Edelweiss Village Assisted Living. Edelweiss Village is located on the German Center campus, which a lot of you are probably familiar with because it's been around in this community for over 100 years. And it's also been caring for a lot of seniors for over the 100 years. Um, a lot of our seniors and residents couldn't make it today, so I'm here on behalf of them. Um, we 
noticed after the pandemic, socialization, making friends, having a good quality of life as you age is so important. And so I feel the need that the Senior Center will extend some more activities outside of our assisted living and our skilled nursing facility um, to assist the community because this is a wonderful community and um, you guys are so welcoming. So it will be such a benefit to have. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jane Colagiovanni. I've been a resident of West Roxbury most of my life. I was talking with my son last night about th this meeting, and actually it was his suggestion. He said to me, you know the um, building where Clay Chevrolet used to be, right at the corner of Belgrade Avenue, West Roxbury Parkway? He said that would be a great spot. There's lots of public transportation coming up through Roslindale. It's on the commuter rail. There is parking, or there would be space for parking, and that would be a building that potentially could be converted into a senior center. So I just thought I would throw that out to all those who are interested. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Foley. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon, but good afternoon. Um, I've been a West Foxbury resident for 53 years, but I'm still not a West Foxbury light. You know, you're still yeah, older people will know that. But I appreciate you for, for, for this format. Excuse me, I've had a stroke, so it's hard to find my words. But Senior Citizen Center started off years ago on storefronts. You had Kit Clark, you had to, um, Harriet down, down in, um, They've, and you got out, out. So, uh, did I hear you right that you can't fund a, um, a storefront that you have to build? I don't know if I heard you right, the commissioner. Because why can't we start off in the box with the storefront? You got Family Dollars that's closed. You got the Hebrew Hab that crossed the street that's closed. You've got the little red store down close. You've got St. Stephen's Church that is wonderful for the community. They've got the ramps, they got the, they got the bus service, and they'd be willing. You've got that, what do we call that, building in the VFW Parkway. Um, <laughs> they have a wide open space. They've got three places that I know you'd be welcome. You've got Clark um, Buick across the street that owns that building that's empty. You've got two buildings on West Foxbury, Washington, the Grove area. They got a great big place in parking, bus. So, I mean, I mean, I go back when we started West Roxbury High, and it took five years, and by that time, our kids couldn't go there. And look at, look at the school now, it's gone. So that, now, and so it's like, can we look into that at all? And, and I didn't hear the gentleman, his name with the tall, the tall gentleman that was here that spoke about having the money. And he talked about stuff. I didn't get his name. Rep. Coppinger. Rep. Ed Coppinger. Ed Coppinger. The tall? Yeah, the tall guy, Representative Ed Coppinger. Right, so I mean a lot of us, I am now partially shut in. So it's just like we didn't even hear about this meeting. And it wasn't until my son called me and said, Mom, it was like, oh, it takes me six hours to get ready to go to a meeting, but it's like, <laughs> you know, we got to think about fluid pills, no, 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 yeah. And so, and I love this gentleman, he said, speak up. West Roxbury people have not spoken up. I remember coming here 52 years ago and I said, there's any drug issues in West Roxbury? And they said, no, we don't have any of that. And when you look at the statistics, it's like, oh, I mean, so I think we have to speak up. I don't see the press here. And, and, and um, I don't, I, I'm very upset. I see our politicians left us. Weren't they interested in hearing us? No, they're still here. Yes, some, yeah. some of us are still here. Yes, some, and I thank you. Some of us, yeah. We all work but, together. So, uh, I mean, we voted for them, and it's just like, 
we have we have something to say. You know, so thank you. And thank you. I like, recognize you a lot. Thank you very much. We appreciate the effort as everyone has taken to get here this morning, so thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. I'm Sarah Hamlin. Um, I probably was in the room 15 years ago. And now I'm looking forward to being a senior soon. <laughs> and I hope it will go on for several decades being a senior. Um, I live in West Roxbury. My parents lived in West Roxbury. I grew up, you know, a mile over the border. Um, I just wanted to, to thank the councilors for coming. I love the idea of the portable city council. I love, um, I want to just do a huge thank you to Ethos. They um, have been a part of my life as I've tried to care for my aging parents, uh, to find resources for, you know, just to have somebody local that you can call and say, my 91-year-old aunt lives in Buffalo. Where would I start that conversation? In Buffalo, they have a, a nonprofit group called the Canopy of Neighbors, which is very similar to JP. Um, I think one of the things I want to ask is that you encourage our assumptions about age to, to look at them again. Um, I would like to see us assume that technology is equally available for people with disabilities of any kind to embrace the ADA laws rather than drag our feet about our buildings, uh, to bring and share and borrow technologies that allow our seniors to be um, connected with one another and to really take a look at why our MBTA services are so limited here in West Roxbury. Is there a law that could be changed about the buses connecting on the parkways? Are, could shuttles for seniors be allowed on the parkways? Um, I also want to just say that we have a, a wonderful opportunity to keep using the library space. The Rosendale Library transformation for ADA is spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a study room. It's got, um, it's got a very flexible design so that you can use the community room for storytelling for preschoolers at one time of day. You could have the Tech Goes Home program for teaching computers for 55 and older. Um, and then everything folds up and goes back into a closet and you can clean it easily. And my last point is um, just thinking ahead about climate change in the next 15 years. The city, I hope, will in expand uh, cooling centers, places where elders and others with health conditions can get air conditioning, ways of keeping us warm and safe in the winter. So I just wanted to, to ask for equity and inclusion and to really thank you because I do think we need a place for seniors to gather. And um, I hope the competition for funding between seniors and youth and will won't be our primary goal. Our, our primary goal is to have a healthy community where all the generations cooperate and care for all our seniors. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Kathy Slade. I'm a lifelong resident of Rosendale. The only other place in the whole wide world I would want to live is West Roxbury. I've been, <laughs> honest to God, I'm boring, I guess. I do have a summer house in Maine, so I enjoy swimming in the ice cold water up there. It's nice to get away. Uh, but um, I don't know where to start, except for to say I'm glad Councilor Laura had this. I just found out about this a couple of days ago, and then I appreciate all the other city councilors who are here. Uh, I don't know where I was going to go after that, but uh, I appreciate it. And somebody, Judy, Joyce, oh, she mentioned that it's, it's, it's wonderful to have the uh, youth involved in some of the senior programming. I ran Healthy Rosendale Coalition for eight years, nonprofit. Uh, well, we weren't a nonprofit, but we signed up to get money through another nonprofit. And um, we did a lot of different things. And what I liked, 
I started off to, with the um, youth group, kids in my own neighborhood, uh, my kids and their friends. So uh, it was all a white population at the time. As, as things progressed, we became much more integrated because I did a lot of work on public safety down in the Archdale neighborhood. And I ended up getting a lot of, towards the last couple of years, most of the kids in my group were Haitian. I had more fun with them than anybody else. Uh, because they appreciated it. They didn't have much to do. They lived down in a neighborhood where single parent, <coughs> parent homes and they didn't get out and do much. Uh, we did a lot of work on public speaking and they got so much confidence and, and we, they, we did a lot of work. We went to the Rosendale House work with seniors and the kids were so proud of themselves because they would walk down the street and people would say hi to them and they said, Oh, you know us? Yeah, you're a Rossi rep. We know you. You do great work. Uh, so I, I think intergenerational programs are great. Uh, and I just want to thank you for coming here. I didn't know about this till uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, and no one mentioned the parkway at first. And I said, well, I hope I'm not an interloper. Uh, but uh, so I appreciate you being here and calling this meeting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abby Henrich. I'm the pastor of the Stratford Street United Church, which is also the home of Rose's Bounty Food Pantry. And I, um, again, would like to echo what Judy Joe's Roddy said, a member of our church, that we have space and it will be ADA compliant, which has been a long, long time goal of ours and is now going to happen, well, is happening. But I also hope that it seems that there is clear that there's a need for a senior center in your own space here, and I hope that happens. But I encourage you not to stay siloed. And what I mean by that is if there is a senior center built, I hope you will invite others to your senior center and that you will have programming for youth and adult, you know, youth and children or that you would invite anxiety-ridden parents so that you could hold our hands and tell us that our teenagers will not end up in the gutter. <laughs> but one of my very favorite things in the universe about church, and I don't think it just happens at only churches, and the reason why I've always enjoyed being a pastor is that you can't remain siloed in an intergenerational community. And I like hanging out with kids, and I like hanging out with people my age, and I like hanging out with seniors, and I like hanging out with everyone in between. And why I think it's incredibly important to be around folks who understand who we are in the particular challenges and joys of our space, I hope that we can continue to be together because we need you all big time. If anyone wants to come to fold my laundry, they could. No, I'm kidding. But um, we need you. And Rose's Bounty Food Pantry has um, proven this. And that's the other thing that's really exciting about hap that's happening there is because we have young children working alongside seniors. And we have youth. And we, we have everybody in between. And we're so grateful that you've done so much volunteering at Rose's Bounty. And we're grateful for our partnership with Ethos. And we're super grateful for the support of the city council. So thank you so much for all being here and what you are all doing. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dale Mitchell, and I am a 50-year-long resident of Jamaica Plain, which was earlier described as one of the surrounding communities. I hope it will be one of the integral communities for when this senior center uh, gets up and running. And while I want to thank the city councilors for having this hearing here in the community, I think that's extraordinarily important. I want to thank everyone from West Roxbury and the surrounding communities, the integral communities, for turning out for this very, very important event. Um, many of you may know me from my previous life. I was, for 25 years, the chief executive officer of Ethos, which is a name that has been bandied about quite a bit 
today, and um, it was one of my um, most frustrating experiences during that tenure that senior voices are not adequately heard and our needs are not being adequately met. And it's really through um, turnouts like this, extraordinarily impressive turnouts like this on an advocacy issue that is so absolutely critical for moving forward. So I hope everyone, let's give ourselves a big round of applause. I just want to say something about how important I think a senior center is, particularly in this neighborhood. My former colleague Ray Santos mentioned that 15 years ago Ethos did a needs assessment. I, don't, I think it might have been a little bit longer ago than that, but at any rate it was during my tenure. And we uh, intentionally decided to choose West Roxbury, which was at the time a rather strange neighborhood to choose in terms of a needs assessment because West Roxbury is often viewed as a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of needs. Um, but in terms of aging, that is exactly incorrect. It is our belief and uh, the experience of ethos, at least while I was there, that of all of the neighborhoods in the city of Boston, in terms of aging, West Roxbury may be the one with the greatest level of need of all, and that is not only because of the large number of elders who live here, but it's also attributable to the characteristics of the neighborhood. This is a neighborhood which, unlike many of the other neighborhoods in the city of Boston, is comprised mostly of single family and two family houses. And people are more, as we get older, we are more at risk of being isolated in that kind of housing than we are in senior housing or apartment multi-unit complexes. And it's also been mentioned that uh, public transportation is less available in West Roxbury than it is in many other neighborhoods. So you combine those two factors and you realize that people who are growing older in West Roxbury are in fact much more isolated and much more at risk, because isolation is one of the greatest risks associated with getting older. It often leads to premature institutionalization, nursing home placements. And it was our contention and the reason why we developed the program, Age Well West Roxbury, that um, uh, we wanted, that was the need that we wanted to address. Age Well West Roxbury, though, and all of the community work that Ethos does and others do in West Roxbury is really only a stopgap measure. It can never replace the kind of intensive programming and accessibility and availability that a senior center would be able to do. I just want to say, and I really hope this happens, and I hope it doesn't take 15 years to do, because I won't be around to, make, uh, to avail myself of it. But I do want to say one other thing. Since I retired, I've gotten involved in a group called Outstanding Life. Outstanding Life is a, a new nonprofit that's trying to create a virtual senior center for older LGBTs lesbian, gay men, bisexuals, and transgenders. And the reason why we're trying to do that is because certain communities are particularly isolated. Certain older people are particularly isolated, even in the context of senior centers. Many people like me are afraid to go to existing senior centers because we will be ostracized. So it is my hope that if this senior center gets off the ground, and I strenuously hope it does, and it doesn't take 15 years to make that happen, that it is opened up with an explicit, explicit mandate, because otherwise it won't happen, an explicit mandate that it reach out to isolated and marginalized communities within Southwest Boston, not just older LGBTs, but Somalis, Haitians, people who speak Spanish, African Americans, 
Caribbean Americans, the entire rainbow of people that we have living in Southwest Boston, so that this senior center is a real beacon of diversity and unity in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wasn't gonna get up here. I wasn't going to go up here, but good morning, good afternoon. I am Mary Ellen Walsh. I am a lifelong resident of West Roxbury, and I just recently retired. Um, so I am a senior citizen, I guess, and it's beyond the age of 55. Um, and I formerly was the social service director at the Altenheim Nursing Home, assistant living, senior place, and our wonderful memory loss neighborhood. I have dealt with ethos for a long time. I dealt with Dale through our ups and downs and all arounds with the beginning at ethos. I worked with Ray since he started at ethos. Um, and I have to give them credit. One of the things I'm really surprised is to see this happening here. Here in West Roxbury where we can meet with the city councils and everybody here on the board. This is, I walked in here, I wasn't, didn't know what to expect. I personally did not find out about this only through my church bulletin that had a flyer in it. So I was disappointed in that, but when I saw the crowd, it was nice to know that somehow the message got through. I am speaking on behalf of not only now being a senior citizen myself, um, but knowing all the citizen, senior citizens I have dealt with over the years, um, almost 23 years at the Altenheim, but I also dealt with four years old at St. Teresa's School where I ran a program for six years. So the intergenerational needs to be done here in West Roxbury, it is so important. And you guys out there gave me lessons over my lifetime. I want to be able to share that with our young kids. And if we don't have an area that we can call our own and not worry about, oh, the kids are coming in for their group, we better lock this up. Um, that's scary. That's scary not only for us, but also for the children. I think it's definitely a well-deserved and well-needed. There are lots of areas, and I've heard so many different suggestions, which also came to my mind. Um, one of them in particular, one gentleman spoke about St. Teresa's Convent. Um, there's a definite need for people to be right next to a school. You know, incorporate that. We used to have special friends day where you adopted a child. A lot of these children don't have families and you guys have special, special, special guidance to help them through their, their youth. But again, a senior center, I've been hearing this for years, all my life here. And I am honored to be a West Roxburghite and I thank you again for hearing, but it is definitely well, over, overdue, overdue. And guys, please continue to speak up. We need you guys' voices. My graduate students that I dealt with for over 20 years from different colleges in schools of social work, I was able to get numbers, how many seniors, how many single family homes, how many apartments, and I still use that same data through the city of Boston neighborhood development. And I use that as a teaching basis to teach them what we have here. And yes, it is the golden ages. And yes, we deserve the best here. And we do deserve it. Every single one sitting here and those who have left, hey, power to you and let's keep going. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I ask my colleagues to make some closing remarks, um, I really uh, want to thank you all for coming today. Your voices are incredibly important and I'm so impressed with the number of folks who, who, who came to attend this very important hearing. I also want to thank our friends at the, the Elks of West Roxbury for hosting us, did a fabulous venue here and we're really, um, we came here for a site visit last week and everybody was just moving, moving everything to make this happen and make it a success in our partnership. I also want to thank, this meeting happens remotely because of the incredible work of our central staff. Um, 
When you bring a, a meeting out to a community, you have to come and do a site visit ahead of time. It's a lot of work, and I really appreciate all the efforts of our central staff. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to Councillor Lara, who's the lead sponsor, and, uh, and close, it, uh, close it out for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Wow. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you. I, when I was elected to represent District 6, I was like, you know, I'm going to be representing JP and West Roxbury, two neighborhoods that are very, very much well known for speaking out and showing up and getting organized. <laughs> and as a community organizer myself, one of the things that gets me the most excited is when I see people organize themselves and show up. And I am incredibly, incredibly humbled to represent you. I mean, 200 people in a room. They had to expand the room out. They had to double the room in size so that we could all fit here. And I just want to say thank you because, one, it is much easier to fight for you at City Hall when I know that I have the support and the backing of my constituents. And I know that I have you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think I speak for every counselor that is here today to say that we are committed to making this happen and we are committed to ensuring that it doesn't take 15 years. So thank you again. Thank you all for attending and uh, you know where we are. Um, please continue this incredible advocacy and we'll see what we can get, make it happen. Oh, we gotta, we gotta gavel us out. Oh.